Show us what you're looking at. The Hollywood Reporter. Yeah. I was blacklisted from 50 to 58 in movies, and then another two or three years in television. I did not get off the blacklist till 1964. My life up to that point had been so magically fortunate. I was very active in radio, making a very decent living. I was nominated in 1952 for an Academy Award. And in 1952, I won the Cannes Festival Award for Best Actress. Paramount Pictures of all first jobs ever as an actress, and nothing but leads. I wouldn't characterize my beliefs as communist beliefs. I would call them socialist beliefs. I lean a lot towards socialism even now. I don't think there's anything dirty about it. It always identified with working people. And because my first mature feelings about politics were formed during this depression, and so I, I became a communist. I never thought there'd be repercussions, particularly. Being a communist, uh, it may have been thought of not socially acceptable, particularly, but it was nothing you went to jail for, for being. And I was... I, I hope nobody's listening. <laughs> First of all, there was the House on American Activities Committee. And the people who were blacklisted in California, in Hollywood, were famous writers, famous actors. Larry Parks being the first actor to get in front of the House on American Activities Committee and be stunned by their asking him to name everybody that he saw at his Communist Party meetings. And about that time, Red Channels came out. And if you were in Red Channels, you were automatically blacklisted unless you went and cleared yourself. Within the union itself, there were people who were so much opposed to the kinds of political positions that I took uh, that they were participated in the effort to get me blacklisted. The fact is that the leaders, I mean the board, they aided and abetted the blacklist. They wanted it. They wanted people like me out of the way. In that time, I was a brand new member of the Screen Actors Guild Board of Directors. And the whole preoccupation was communism. And I questioned that and said, I, I really don't understand why that's the issue. That's politics, that's what people's choice is, isn't it? Eyes rolled and apparently the other side decided that I must be one. I was writing a show at CBS called Danger and I'd been writing very happily for them. Came in one day and uh, the producer said to me, there's a, there's a problem here, you have to put another name on the script. And I said, why? He said, I don't know. They just told me upstairs that I can't use you anymore. Uh, that's when I really knew I was blacklisted. I had good, dear friends who I had known for some time who had become producers, directors, and he said, Cliff, you're on, the, you're on the list. We can't use you anymore. I left Detective Story to do a play called All You Need Is One Good Break, which was written by my husband-to-be, Arnold Manoff, and Arnie Manoff was a lefty. I can't say a communist because it's still like naming names to me. And so I became associated with him. From that day on, for 12 years, I couldn't work in film or television. We went to England to make a film, and when we went over to France for what we thought would be a few weeks vacation, and our friends told us, phoned us to Paris and said, don't come back because they'll send you to Washington to testify and 
you'll never work again in Hollywood anyway. Well, I heard that there was that CBS had this committee, and if you uh, thought you were being blacklisted, you could go and see them, and uh, with some expectation that maybe they could help you. So I, I arranged to have this meeting, and they said, Cliff, we'll be very forthright with you. If you want to get off the blacklist, you've got to give the names. And I said, I appreciate your candor, and you know what you can do? <laughs> Our industry was under attack. Every headline, every newscast, even newsreels, was blazing the news that Hollywood movies were filled with secret communist propaganda. And there was a panic in the industry that people would stop going to movies. Something had to be done. We flew to Washington to tell the people, the movie-going people, movies are still safe. We're not interested in communism, but in freedom of speech. Humphrey Bogart on our flight was probably as vociferous in his passion about the need for our flight and to our outrage for what was happening uh, in that committee in Washington. It was only a couple of weeks later that both the Bogarts, Lauren Bacall and her husband, gave an interview saying, we think our flight to Washington was ill-advised, and we we're sorry we made it. The industry succumbed. You got the sense by 58 that it was breaking up. There were cracks in the, in the blacklist. They were not a communist, for one thing. They, you know, they, no, nobody left. I was the only blacklisted, certainly woman, to make it, to have a career again, to have the kind of career I had after the blacklist. You have to understand how motivated I was. I had such a rage, and I had 12 years to make up for, and nothing was going to stop me. I'm sure the FBI checked me out and found me lacking as a subversive, as a communist at least. And uh, uh, I don't know, I began making an occasional film. It was never the same. The momentum was gone. The roles that had real challenge to them never came again. Gene and I agreed some time ago that if we were to live our lives over again, we would do the same thing because we believed in what we were doing. Believe in something or you act on it, you take the consequences. Uh, I don't regret it. Oh, I have no regrets. I think that at that time, that was the right thing to do. What took place in our nation, starting in Washington, was ugly was unfair, and you know, for well over a decade, this was neither the land of the free nor the home of the brave. The end. <laughs> Thank you so much.